This committee will come to order. Members, good morning. It's good to see you. It's May 4th. We have four bills um, on the docket today. And um, we have, uh, actually, we have quite a bit, of, quite a bit more work to do uh, this week and next week also. But with that, we're going to start with Senator Housley. Welcome, Senator. Uh, Senate File 4209. Thank you, Madam Chair. Before you is Senate File uh, 4209 creating an uh, office for the ombudsperson for fosters. Um, I have an A6 amendment, uh, an amendment to get the bill in the shape I'd like it to be before I present it. Madam Thank Chair, you. I Senator Ingebrigtsen. I would offer the A6 amendment. Senator um, Ingebrigtsen moves the A6 amendment. Uh, can you briefly explain what the A6 does, Senator Housley? Um, yes, Madam Chair. This was added in the House when this bill went through the House committee process. Um, in, on page six, line three, after governor, um, instead of just having it be at the governor's discretion, they wanted to add that they will, the legislative committees will also have jurisdiction over child welfare in the state government. Very good. With all the, with that, um, Senator Ingebrigtsen renews this motion on the A6. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Motion prevails. Amendment is adopted. Senator Housley, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this bill, I'm speaking directly to the critically important issue of ensuring that children in our state's care. Can you, can you oh, grab you that microphone? Okay. There you go. There is you go. that good? Yeah. Better. Okay. Um, speaking to the critically at need of our foster care system um, and the children and treating them the same as we treat our children in our own homes, the Ombudsperson Office aims to provide oversight for these systems that are tasked with protecting Minnesota's children from harm and create a vehicle that can adequately track the issues affecting young people in Minnesota. The, the reason this is needed is because fosters don't have a resource right now or an avenue for intervention when they're being abused or ne neglected at the hands of our own child protection system. Uh, it's something that you think we would have had in place before now, and, and uh, it's kind of shocking that we haven't, so there's a real need for it. As it stands, there are no organizations or entities that track complaints or common concerns that arise for fosters. Uh, and without this data, we're left powerless to affect meaningful changes in our existing structures. And uh, by establishing an ombudsperson office for fosters, we're creating an organizational structure that's going to create positive change, allow for more capacity to do independent investigations, and track where significant intervention need is needed. Um, navigating the foster system alone is a challenging task in itself, and without these uh, tools and advocates will continue to fail these children and continue to repeat this all too common cycle that we see in our communities. Uh, and if passed, this office would positively affect Minnesota's child welfare system by one. Um, the child welfare system will experience fewer complaints to county offices. The fosters will experience a more fair process to access resources such as housing. And a separate ombudsperson office will prevent homelessness and other risks. So that's pretty much the bill, uh, Madam Chair. It asks for $775,000 um, to create the office. Well, thank you, Senator Housley. Mr. Young. Madam Chair and members, on line 6.3, section 6 of the bill, as Senator Housley has identified, has an appropriation of 775 and 23. It then proceeds on line 6.7 to set a base for fiscal year 24 and 25. And so Senator Housley and the committee has been talking about three-year numbers. So the number is 2.227 over three years. Thank and you. And it's all from, from the general fund. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Madam Chair. And Senator Housley, I know you have a guest with you, but um, normally we just allow um, department heads and commissioners, but if you'd like to just um, introduce yourself and uh, just a few comments, that would be great. Thank sure. you, since Thank you're you. there. Uh, my name is Wong Murphy, and I am the founder and executive director of a nonprofit called Foster Advocates, and we work with young people who have experienced foster care to create policy change. And Thank you. Yeah, thank you for working with Senator Housley on this. I've, I've done a lot my, uh, myself. Um, many of us have with the, the foster youth um, issues that, um, and there's many issues. So, are there any questions on the amended uh, 4209? I don't see any questions. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Oh, final comments, Senator Housley. Oh, thank you so much, Madam Chair, for uh, the opportunity and committee members uh, to hear this bill. And uh, we really, really are thankful. Our last stop, this is nine stops we've been going through. So uh, 
Thank you. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Means Thank a lot you, to Senator the Senator. foster children of Minnesota. Madam Chair. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Ma Madam Chair, I move that Senate File 4209, as amended, be recommended to pass and be placed on general orders. On that motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay? Motion prevails. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Senator Housley. Thank, Thank you for coming. Okay, Senator Uckey. Senator Uckey, I tried to read your bill. It's very confusing. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a confusing bill. <laughs> You've been to a lot of stops, too. Good morning. Good morning, Senator Uckey. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members. And uh, first up, would, we do have the A7 amendment to um, finalize the last of the changes in this bill. If you'd like to adopt that, and then I can. Go Senator, ahead a can you bit. grab that um, grab that microphone a little better if you could? And also, we have the A6 also. The is A7 two amendments? is the most current. Okay. It was just so. uh, um, we we all received it late yesterday. Okay, wonderful. May 7th, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen. I would move the A7. The A7 amendment is moved by Senator Ingebrigtsen. And Mr. Nauman, do you, would you like to explain what's on that fiscal note? So, Madam Chair and members, Madam Chair and members, uh, there is a fiscal note in your packet. Um, the fiscal note identifies a $19,000 general fund expenditure and an ongoing revenue source to the Secretary of State of $6,000 in fiscal year 23, um, and then a $3,000 fiscal effect in 24 and 25. I believe, um, <clears throat> Madam Chair and members, on line 6.5 of the... <clears throat> Madam Chair, you and I are in the same spot. Yeah, you, well, you gave it to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, the, the amendment identifies a 19, appropriates $19,000 in fiscal 23 that comports with the, with the, uh, fiscal note and then an ongoing base of $3,000 a year. So the cost is, um, in comparison to the overall general fund, relatively small. Thank you, Mr. Nauman. And, um, you said the A7 just gets it into the, into the shape that you need. Correct. The A6 that you first received earlier yesterday um, with the final look over from um, council and staff, they found one, a couple little things. So there was a couple lines that were adjusted in the A7, which that just completed it and made it 100% correct. Wonderful. Okay. Any questions on the A7 amendment? Senator Inka Britson renews this motion on the A7 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All, Aye. The, all those opposed, nay? Motion prevails. The A7 is adopted. And Senator Aki, to your bill. Thank, as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. And members, um, this is our structured settlement bill. Um, and the amendment that you just uh, adopted for us is, uh, uh, and the, probably the biggest part of it was what uh, uh, Mr. Nauman just uh, talked about, and that was the appropriation. Um, this bill uh, originally started out with a uh, using the Department of Commerce as the uh, place where our businesses would register and uh, uh, complete their uh, bonding requirements, et cetera, and then now has been switched to the Secretary of State. We have now finalized this, and we now have a cost, which um, is in the, the new language, which the biggest share of that cost is just setting up the process of this registration. And then after that, the ongoing is uh, very minimal. Um, and as you will see in the bill, there is uh, fees that will be collected from these uh, settlement purchasers. Um, so in the end, uh, fees will cover the cost, but the, the fees do go into the general fund so that the uh, costs come back out of the general fund. But um, in the amendment, there was, this has been an ongoing process for uh, a number of months, and the amendment just kind of tightened up, finalized all the different uh, uh, small moving pieces that were left between all of those involved, all advocate parties. Um, it, uh, this whole thing um, started last October when there was a, 
article in the Star and Tribune about how uh, people were being taken advantage of by these structured settlement purchasers. There was, a, the, of course, like in everything, there was mostly good ones out there, but there were some bad actors. Um, and with this bill that's before us, it has tightened up um, the parameters around that, um, which a big part of it is adding the registration. So now these businesses need to register. And uh, being with the Secretary of State, they also have to provide a surety bond. Um, and then we went in and gave the uh, courts, uh, we tightened that up, and then also gave the judges some extra tools in their toolbox to make sure that in the end, um, this whole thing is about protecting the payee, which is the person who would be selling their settlement to get that one times um, larger sum up front. And, uh, and then lastly, uh, as we talk about the, the person receiving the settlement, um, going the extra step too for minors. Um, so if there's a minor involved in this uh, um, proposed sale that that it's in their best interest. Everything is about the best interest of that payee and in particular minors so that parents or guardians or somebody is not, they're not taking advantage of this opportunity and grabbing that money and spending it on something unrelated to that person. So um, beyond that, the rest of the amendment and if you've, uh, um, looked at the bill at all, the amendment just kind of was tweaking the final language to make sure everybody was on board. And uh, at this point, we've got uh, full agreement. This bill originally was an NCOIL Model Act, uh, which then got expanded. Uh, Louisiana, Georgia, Nevada have added the extra language that we're working with, and that's what we're doing at NCOIL now is to expand that. This will hopefully be something that most all states will adopt in the end, and that's to add this additional security for those that are selling um, these lump sum payments. Very good. Very good, Senator Arke. Any questions? I do not see any questions. Okay, Senator Arke, final comments? Nope, I think that's, uh, that pretty well covers it. I thank you okay. for hearing this, and I believe our next stop is uh, the floor. Uh, very good. Uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Madam Chair, I move that Senate File 3636 be recommended to pass and be placed on general orders. As, as amended. As amended. On that motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion prevails. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Rucky. You're very good. Good morning, Senator Lang. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. Senator Lang, I think I'm going to have Senator Root come up okay. uh, to the table at the same time, please. Senator Root. Good morning. Good morning, Senator Root. So, um, We've got the two bills before us, and we do have um, we do have some testifiers also. So, who would like to start with this, Senator Lang? Would you like uh, to go ahead? I sure can, Madam Chair. Uh, so, members, before you, I have a uh, delete all that is the representation of the February forecast and the change in the funding for the uh, Lasard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council and the recommendations that go along with them. Um, this, again, is the, uh, I think, you know, the important thing is the money, but it, of course I have to start out with saying that we protect almost 81,000 acres uh, in this bill. We talk about 127 miles of shoreline is protected. Uh, we talk about 90% of the, the uh, projects that come in front of us are funded. And also the, you know, the activities include uh, things like native prairie protection, wetland restoration, trout stream enhancement, public wildlife land enhancement, shell lake enhancement, 
forest fragmentation prevention, strategic land acquisition, and fee and title conservation and easement. So it's not just the money that we're talking about, but obviously it's the property, and obviously it's the projects that go to protect that property. So uh, there's, uh, as far as the funding goes, Madam Chair, uh, this is the, uh, the most money. I asked that question this morning to Mr. Johnson, who is here if we uh, uh, need any additional information, but uh, this is the most money that uh, the Outdoor Heritage Fund has ever spent, received, uh, had the opportunity uh, to put into the environment. Um, we are currently at $159,449,000 uh, for the A2 amendment, which is a substantial uh, amount of money. So. Thank you, Senator Lang. Uh, Senator Rood. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Well, this year's funding package was unanimously approved uh, by the Lasart Sams Outdoor Heritage Council before being submitted to the legislature via an amendment on uh, Senate File 3701. It contains 42 high priority conservation projects across the state, in addition to more projects that will be funded through the Conservation Partners Legacy Grant Program. The selected projects have been thoroughly vetted by the Lasart Sams Outdoor Heritage Council through its competitive uh, public process, which received over $314 million in requests and resulted in recommendation, recommendations to you today, reflecting the increases in the recommendations after the February forecast of $159 million. Thank you, Senator Bird. Um, we do have the A2 amendment uh, here, and just wondering if somebody would like to address Mr. Mueller, the differences between the A2 and the uh, 2969. The original bill. Um, yes, Madam Chair. Um, the A2 amendment reflects the additional, um, it's about $3.688 million that became available in the February forecast to the Outdoor Heritage Fund. Originally, the Outdoor Heritage, or Star Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council had um, approved or recommended about $155 million that was uh, originally in Senate file. 2969 Senator Lang's bill um, that was that was originally passed out of committee and after that the February forecast came out and added like I said made available another 3.688 million dollars um, and leaving a 6% fund balance in the Outdoor Heritage Fund um, so the reason why we're doing a delete all amendment here is as you can see in the spreadsheet that is um, passed out the $3.688 million was basically allocated throughout all the appropriations in the bill um, pro rata. So it just seemed easier to do a delete all amendment that would change all the appropriations instead of a page in line. But the spreadsheet shows each appropriation and how much it was increased. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nauman, could you please um, tell the members what you just told me? So, Madam Chair and members, um, it's not common in the Finance Committee to uh, have a deleted everything amendment. Um, so I think Mr. Mueller's point is a valid one. I, I think I'm right in saying that there is no substantive change from the base bill um, to, relative to the A2 amendment that the notion here was to make it easier on the committee so that everything was all in one place and members could see it. It's just um, the the additional resources are littered throughout all the additional, all, all the appropriations. Littered sounds pejorative. I didn't mean it. That. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Any questions on the A2 amendment? Mr. Uh, Senator Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, just going over this, I... So this is something that I've never worked on before. It's in this in this realm here, but I'm just going through the amendment and looking at uh, you know subparagraph A in section two. Uh, there were pheasants forever uh, acquiring land and fee. Section B that's a permanent easement. Section six that's a fee. Uh, section D you're acquiring land and fee. Section E is also acquiring land and fee, permanent easement, more fee land. I mean, just going through this whole thing, 
Um, it just amazes me how much land is being used by this. Uh, we currently in the state, the state's one of the biggest property owners that we have. And yet here we've got, I don't know how many millions of dollars that we're uh, using to again take land out of whether it's production or recreation or whatever we have. Um, I'm just wondering, could you explain a little bit about that? I know my constituents up north um, feel that there's plenty of land that uh, is owned either by Nature Conservancy, uh, Ducks Unlimited, whatever it might be. So this one I, I do have a little bit of, of uh, heartburn on. So could you just kind of walk me through that, explain what, what, this, uh, what this is actually doing here? Who would like to take that one? Well, Madam Chair, I think uh, Mr. Johnson would want to come up and uh, explain a little bit of that. Yes, please, that'd I be would, great. I would tell the committee members and, and Senator Johnson, uh, that is a topic of conversation that has come up in the Outdoor Heritage Council several times uh, in, the, in the years I've been here. Um, it, it is something that we are well aware of, especially when, you're, when we are you know, purchasing property at a rate which uh, a, a local government unit could not accomplish. Uh, these uh, these non-governmental -govern organizations could not accomplish that without the Sard Sam's Council or the funding provided. Um, it is it is an area of concern. I think there is probably a tipping point as which we have hopefully not reached yet. But when you talk about uh, your uh, area of the state, oftentimes uh, that isn't southern Minnesota just yet. Uh, we have a lot of. Uh, in, in particular, I would say that there was many different uh, tax forfeited properties in my neck of the woods that could benefit from some Outdoor Heritage Council fundings. However, those land areas are much more expensive than, uh, than you know, typical uh, comparable land from the northern side of the state. So how we uh, accomplish the same a goal using more dollars for less property, I think, is a topic of area of conversation that the council will have to discuss in the future. Um, but as of right now, this is uh, well knowledge uh, folks, much, much like uh, Executive Director Johnson, um, could probably speak a little more plainly on the topic than what I just did. But uh, I don't know. I probably didn't answer your question still. Mr. Johnson, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mark, uh, for the record, Mark Johnson, Executive Director for the Lassard Sams Outdoor Heritage Council. Um, regarding uh, Senator Johnson's very good last name, thank you. Are you guys uh, related, uh, or what's? The <laughs> uh, for the senator's questions, uh, particularly, yes, there are about um, there's about 8,000 acres in fee that is projected to be acquired through these, this appropriation. 5,500 of that approximately is in fee with PILT. So those lands would be coming to the state of Minnesota. They would be primarily wildlife management area properties, some SNAs, and um, I believe some, uh, a little bit of state forest also in that. The um, uh, other 2,800 acres are fee, or are purchased in fee without PILT, meaning they will be going to the local government units. Some of that is in here in the metro. Um, others would be going to, to county forests or municipalities. Uh, there may, there's a little bit of that that will also be going as WPAs to the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And that is, of course, on all of those, there's a notice of funding restriction. Those lands have to continue forward in the use of for habitat, uh, otherwise they're returned to the state. The, um, the, the PILT uh, acquisition properties are primarily in the prairie region of the state, in other words, the southwest and western. And um, in, yeah, uh, I guess that's pretty much it. The, there are a little bit in the metro in the southeast and in the um, uh, uh, Northwest port, or northeastern portion of the state as well, but very little in the northern portion of the state just because of the, the current high levels of public land in those areas. There's, there is, you mentioned easements, there's about 18,000 acres of projected uh, easement acquisition through this, conservation easements, they are permanent easements. The majority of that is done through, through Bowser and the Soil and Water Conservation District, so primarily those are buffer type um, easements and, uh, and so on. Any more questions, I'd be glad to ask or answer. Senator Johnson? You're good? Okay. <laughs> Very good. Senator Rude, did you have any follow-up, too? Anything you'd like to say? Uh, no, Madam Chair. I, I believe Mr. Johnson's done a very good job of explaining it. Okay. Great. So
So Not let's sure. see, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Any further questions on the A2 amendment? Madam Chair. Senator Ingebrigtsen. I would offer the A2 amendment. Senator Ingebrigtsen moves the A2 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. <clears throat> Motion prevails, A2 is adopted. And Madam Chair. do we have, and then we'll go to your bill, Senator Rood, after we pass Senator Lang's bill. Um, Madam Chair. What's that been? Senator Ingebrigtsen. Madam Chair, I, um, if I could, I, I, I could, um, I'd like to make a couple comments. If I could, I was um, on the committee for eight years, the Legacy Committee, and, and that question Senator Johnson brought forward was something that uh, I think has been talked about for some years now, about acquisition of land and, uh, by the state of Minnesota. And of concern, I know in his area there's, there's a huge concern of that. And, um, you know, whenever we talk to the county folks or whenever they come down to visit township folks, uh, they say they're taking uh, land out of, out of production. Um, and, you know, they just don't agree with that. Um, however, uh, these folks, I believe, and I'll, I'll, I'll direct a question to uh, Director uh, uh, Johnson with regards to selling land. These are willing sellers, I believe, uh, and also that how much of this land is actually crop production land? Do you know that you have a percentage of that? I know it's very compromised land, most of the land that... that uh, Lassard Sams gets involved with because obviously it's for wildlife uh, um, Dr. habitat. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator, the uh, the lands are primarily, uh, you know, they're targeted for habitat. In other words, these are properties that traditionally were, um, I shouldn't say traditionally, originally were, were good habitat, meaning wetlands or uplands that were prone for habitat. Um, there are several of these of these properties that are uh, uh, native prairie that there are acquisition. That's one of the target areas is native prairies. As far as how a percent that is um, uh, cropland, I cannot tell you that um, because when you do a, a wetland restoration, it may be that that is cropped. It's drained and cropped at this time, but it's it's those croplands basically are not productive and are not not very productive. So they are, maybe I should best say, these are generally less productive lands if they are ag lands, and then they are converted back to that uh, original wetland that was drained um, or the, the uh, prairie situation that, that is desired for that habitat use. When it's, when it's owned by a, uh, an LGU, a, a, a local municipality, and then of course it's public space, but it's also open to the public. And, uh, and the lands that go into county forests, of course, those are, can, are not agricultural lands at all. And the chunk of those are always go back to supporting the public from a, ta from a uh, um, timber standpoint. All the revenues go back to the counties. I'm sorry, I'm deviating off from your question. Senator Ingebrigtsen, yeah. and I know we have a question from Senator Pratt, too. <clears throat> Madam Chair, thank you uh, uh, for the indulgence. So, um, Senator Johnson, I, you know, I, uh, I've been hearing those complaints since probably the beginning of the of the uh, Lassard Sams and, and uh, <clears throat> I guess my my comeback to that is always you have a willing seller out there if it's a purchase if it's an acquisition uh, some of them are, are uh, fees but some some are acquisitions and and my my answer has always been that if if somebody's a willing seller and the neighbor doesn't want to sell it uh, there's always uh, somebody uh, that's willing to do that for habitat, and that's either been <laughs> Pheasants for other, Forever, Deer Hunters Association, all those uh, organizations that want to restore and keep uh, the land, uh, in most cases, available for everybody. So basically everybody can enjoy those, those lands. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can afford to uh, buy a 40, 80, or 160-acre patch of land in Minnesota to hunt in, and I think this that was what the whole intention, or one of the intentions of, of the legacy amendment back in 2007 or 8, whatever it was, when we 
when the public voted for it. So I know it's always a contentious issue. It is in mine, mine as well. I mean, the state of Minnesota owns a lot of land. The question is, can they manage it? That's always been the big thing. Can, can the DNR manage that, continue to... Uh, it's questionable at times whether they're managing the, the land that they have already. And uh, so I know it's certainly been a concern. And, and uh, but we have, you know, we have committee members. And that, that kind of leads me, Madam Chair, but you said somebody else had a question? Why yes, actually, um, Senator could, Pratt and then Madam Senator Chair, Benson. And then I have an amendment. Madam Chair. Is Senator Johnson? Could I just follow up on Senator Engelbertson? Yes, to, on, Senator to that Johnson. Point? Mm -hmm. So, I, and I, I realize that I've stepped into something here and I don't want to <laughs> stir the pot too much, but I, I do also have to speak for my constituents in my area. I, I trust Senator Lang and Senator Rood and the work that they've done on this bill. And I don't mean to, to tarnish that at all. It, they've, they've spent a lot of time and I know that they are real advocates for their constituents and their people in the state of Minnesota as well. Plus, you know, the fund that, that we've been given responsibility over through uh, the constitutional amendment. So I, I understand that and I get that, but I also understand too that we've got farmers up in Hallock and, and Northwest Minnesota who are competing against, for their small farms, competing against East Coast and West Coast uh, investors who have been coming in. In fact, Bill Gates is one of the largest owners of fa farmland across the nation. And you've, you also feel the pinch from our own state government and federal fund or state funds that are coming in and competing against that. And all of a sudden you've got these family farms who are trying to buy land but can't do it, so they end up, end up renting land from whether it's Bill Gates or, or whoever they need to be renting, and all of a sudden they become basically tenant farmers at that point. So we've got to be really careful on, they might be willing sellers, these, these people who own the land and are trying to sell, but when you have these big dollars that are coming in, how are you supposed to be able to compete when you've got to mortgage the farm or the house to do that versus these cash payments from the state government or you know east or west coast investors at the same time so we've really got to be careful about that and what the image that we're bringing forward with this sort of thing as well so i appreciate the work that you're doing but at the same time i do want to put a, a note of caution in uh, with that as well thank you senator johnson i think we'll go to senator pratt thank you thank you madam chair and, and just a quick question i, I want to understand a little bit better. Will purchasing these lands create an ongoing state or local obligation for property taxes uh, or payment in lieu of taxes? Director Johnson? Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Pratt. Director Johnson, you might want to get closer to that microphone. Uh, yeah. Madam Thank Chair you. and Senator Pratt, pardon me for that. The, uh, those lands that are purchased, those 5,500 I mentioned that will be retained by the state of Minnesota, for wildlife purposes, habitat purposes, will have PILT, uh, payment in lieu of tax obligation. The uh, non-PILT properties, the other 2,800 acres, I think it was, will not. And uh, some of those lands do stay on the tax rolls, the lands that are held by a nonprofit, which in this case, I think only the Nature Conservancy is acquiring or will be holding some of those lands, they will continue to pay the property tax on those properties. Those that are owned by the cities, county, or um, uh, put in trust with the federal government for the state of Minnesota, those will not have built obligation. However, the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does pay a, um, a similar, they have their own PILT type uh, payments that they make. Okay. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. So do we have any idea what that ongoing obligation entails would be? Director Johnson. Um, Madam Chair and Senator, it is. it would be based on the um, appraised value of the property. In other words, the, uh, or the tax value of the property. So it would be three quarters of 1%. Um, in, I, I could get that to you. I don't have it at my fingertips. I'm sorry. Senator Brad? Okay, very good. Senator Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Rood and Senator Lang are doing what is required of them, um, taking the recommendations of the council. It is within the authority of the legislature to say we find value in protecting tillable land. And so I think it might be wise for future legislators to have rigorous hearings as to whether or not this money can be used to acquire tillable lands because if we have um, state dollars going into a competitive marketplace, first of all, is there a cap 
on how much they could spend per acre um, in competing with a, a family farm that's either trying to start. I mean, we have we have Hmong families who don't have a heritage in this state of being able to inherit land who want to expand their farming. And if they're competing with state dollars, um, even the heritage of people who have lived on the land and their grandparents and great grandparents have passed that land down to them, if they're now competing not just with um, large private landowners who don't have a vested interest in the state, but also taking tillable acres. Uh, Minnesota, as part of a stable world food supply, has been a leader. And it needs to be part of this balanced conversation. And so while our authors today are doing what they are asked and required by law, I think it is a worthy conversation to have going forward to restrict how some of these lands um, can be acquired. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Senator Benson. Senator Rood. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, I, just as an aside, um, I really appreciate you, um, this conversation. Um, I, I will tell you that the vetting process of these um, projects is really extensive. They have already started the vetting for next year's uh, project. Um, I always laugh at um, Senator Lang because he walks around with the, the biggest three ring notebook I've ever seen, um, <laughs> trying uh, go, two of them <laughs> going through the projects and ranking the projects and looking at them. And I know Senator Ingerbretson knows this, how much work they put in for a whole year to come up uh, with these projects. And so they're really well vetted. They put a lot of work into this. I will tell you, if you're interested, all the meetings are notified. And so you can listen in. I often listen in to the LCCMR and the legacy um, conversations um, because they're, they're very interesting in the process. And so if that's a process that you're interested in how they vet these lands, um, you're more than welcome to listen to that. It's, it's a very, their very committee hearings are very interested. And maybe it is a conversation that we have going down the road. Um, and so I, I invite you all to listen to those conversations as they happen. And I just want to commend them for all the work. Like I said, Senator in Ingebrigtsen certainly knows all the work that goes into the vetting of this pro these um, projects and priorities. So. In, Madam Chair. Yeah, Senator Lang. Uh, I, I think I would add to that, um, being on the committee now for five years, I think it's been since I've been part of Lassard Sams, um, seeing the success of it, I, I can tell you, I, uh, I don't know if Bob Lassard or Dallas Sams ever thought that we'd be spending $160 million and buying 8,000 acres of land. Um, I don't know if they ever thought that. Uh, I can tell you that their intentions were are pure, and over the course of the, what is it, 14 years since it was initially uh, started spending dollars, we have acquired a lot of land. Um, the question is, does the Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council become a caretaking operation? Does it become more of a, this is, we, we phase through purchasing property, restoring property, and now we're gonna protect it. And that protection includes paying those pill payments, making uh, enhancement to, to land, not just once, but again, over the course of time. And I think that's a bigger discussion the council has started down the path of. Uh, we are still going through the process of, of uh, vetting all these projects, uh, like, much like Senator Rood mentioned. The, the bigger question, I think, is that at the end of the 25 years, uh, do we take a close look at exactly now what the council becomes, now what this fund does, uh, does it pivot and go to uh, a caretaking or really more of a protection uh, viewpoint? And, and that's, it's a bigger question than what we're gonna settle here today, so. What year does that happen? You said? Uh, I believe it's 30, 34, <coughs> 2034. 2034, okay. Okay, very good. Director Johnson, if there's any information that you have uh, to, to Senator Pratt's question, could you make sure the whole committee receives that information, thank you. Senator Ingerbertson. Madam Chair, and, and again, another comment. When, when Pheasants Forever or Ducks Unlimited or, or any of those uh, huge organizations get involved, I think folks need to understand that they actually do the restoration of the projects before they actually get turned over to mm -hmm. the state, if and when they do. So there's an awful lot of money, an awful lot of uh, non-state money that goes into that. We all know about the banquets, we all know about the fundraisers. Uh, all that money goes towards restoration of these projects and 
And uh, they're not just, you know, purchased and, and, and turned over to the DNR for them to do that work. They actually get a jump start. So um, I think for the, for the community of, of hunting and fishing and, and outdoor activity, uh, this has been a tremendous, tremendous thing. And I've always said I never voted for the thing. I never voted to raise my taxes. But the, but the public did. And these dollars have to be directed to where it's supposed to go. And, and uh, this committee does an absolute marvelous job of, of putting together these bills. These, these folks that are, that are members on the committees are from all over the state. Uh, gosh, they bring a lot of good, good stuff to the, to the committee that, that the legislator members uh, certainly don't know that much about. And at least that was my experience. And uh, um, they've had over the years some tremendous members on there. So, um, with that, if, if there's any other question, Ma Madam Chair, I do have an amendment that I would like to offer, if I could. Mm -hmm. Okay, Senator Brisson. I uh, I have what's the offer the A3 amendment, Madam Chair. Senator Ingebrigtsen moves the A3 amendment. Maybe a dis little description first, if that's okay. Um, I don't think it's posted. Is yeah, it? Yeah, it's it posted. posted. Right. Okay, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Over the years, Madam Chair, uh, um, and I think the two authors in front probably have heard this rumbling, and I don't, I, I can't, I have to apologize to Senator Rood and, and uh, uh, Senator Lang if it, it's not been brought up the, uh, in the Legacy Committee. Um, oh, and by the way, I guess I, I wanted to say some other things about Legacy. Folks, th this isn't the only Legacy Bill that comes forward. This is only one third of the Legacy Bill. I, I don't know if you know that or not, but you still have parks, trails, and humanities, and also clean water that comes forth every, you know, Senator Rood brought that forth last year. Uh, so the money you see here is times, is actually times three that, that the, uh, that's going into our environment. Just wanted to make that note. But over the years, there's been some excellent, excellent members. Uh, I started out as, as one of the original members sitting on that committee. I think there is still one member on the committee that might be an original <clears throat> member, but over the years they change. The governor does their appointments, the House does their appointments. Uh, and frankly, uh, uh, after eight years on the committee, I decided to step aside and uh, leadership. I know Senator Lang was interested in doing it and uh, sitting on the committee, serving on the committee. And uh, I just thought it was enough. I thought somebody else had, had, should have an opportunity to be able to do this. And, and uh, I, I guess I've always felt the same thing about, about the citizens. And this is what this amendment talks about, uh, uh, is putting a term limit on the citizens of this committee, uh, as well as I also would like to put term limits, at least bring up the conversation and have the, the talk about term limits on uh, LCCMR that will be coming forward, I think, tomorrow uh, with Senator, uh, Senator Westrom. I did talk to the, uh, to the author before the meeting. Uh, I know this is policy members. I did not bring it to the committee. I know um, I just kind of assumed that, that it was going to show up someplace uh, this year, but it did not, so I'm bringing it forward now. Um, but I think eight years, as it says here, is, is uh, is, is plenty. I think uh, uh, there's so many people in, in our state that, that care about the environment and that want it to be able to put input. Part of the reason this, this bill even passed in its original form was because it was uh, about citizens participating in, in their government and, and uh, seeing where these appropriations go and getting the very good input that we have. We've had, we've had educators, we've had people that work environment. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, we also have the arts and humanities people. Uh, we have some people like that on the committee as well that know that. So um, I just think it's the fair thing to do. Uh, I, I don't know if there would be any opposition other than the fact that it is policy and this is not a policy committee. But I would, I would indulge the committee to, to at least allow this on and, and uh, bring it into a conference committee if there even is one. Usually there isn't much of a conference committee on these two bills. But so that's what I would offer, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Um, we'll go to the authors after Senator Champion. Go ahead, Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would oppose this amendment, Madam Chair, and I have a question for the author. Senator Champion. 
So, uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen, um, is this something you believe in, or has there been identified problems with individuals on the um, on the committee that will warrant such a change? Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the question, uh, Senator. No, this isn't something that I've drummed up. This is something that's been talked about by by a lot of people, and and it's, and it's simply just a, uh, I think, a fairness. Uh, there's not any one particular person or or, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there just isn't one, but um, I, think the, I think the legislature uh, would be uh, very prudent in, in doing that and spreading this, spreading this membership around. I think it's just a fair thing to do. Um, and again, that's why I got off at eight. I could, I could still be sitting on that committee, I guess, if, if I chose to do that, but um, of 24 years of this going on, uh, the more people that, that participate, at least in my view, not only legislators, but citizens committee, committee members, uh, the more the merrier, basically. Uh, and I think after eight years of service, I think it's time to step aside and let somebody else do it. Simple as that. Senator Fa Chairman. A follow-up, Madam Chair? So, S Senator, I, I haven't heard you give me specific names. You see a lot of people have been talking about it. Um, but, but it's my understanding by taking a quick look, and I'm not on this council, um, by looking at this, it, uh, first of all, you were appointed to that uh, position, it sounds like, and that if there needed to be a change, the appointed authority would have the ability to do that. So it, it, it's not like, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, um, from my read of it, it isn't as if you could just decide that, that, that um, uh, appointing authority would have to be the one to still allow you to continue. Uh, is that true or not true? Because uh, because the way that you're talking about it is if you just decided and you just could stay there without uh, recognizing that there is an authority that appointed you to that position. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Madam Chair, no, no, Senator, that's not that's not it at all. The uh, governor appoint has has appointees on there as well as the Senate and the House. That would not change. That would not change. These members would be appointed. The whole th the, the only thing that would change is that they're going to be they're going to be allowed to be on the committee for eight years. Then it's then somebody else just you know gets appointed. Senator Champion. Thank you, M Madam Chair. I don't think that addressed my question. My question was if so if that doesn't change, that means that a, a, a person could serve you know four term four four year terms, and it would appear to me that that four year term once it's up would have to be renewed by the governor's office or whoever appointed that individual. Um, so that would mean that that authority would have the ability to replace someone if they wanted to, but the person serving couldn't just say, I'm going to go on longer without that appointing authority saying it's okay. And so if that's true, then we already have a mechanism in place for, for someone to, you know, be there one term, two terms, or, or, or whatever. It's a pleasure. It's sort of like us. We have term limits, too. Whether we believe it or not, if the voters decide that they no lo longer wanted us, then that is a term limit. That means your time is up. And so I think this policy is very dangerous, Madam Chair, for us to do it here. And if it's been talked about, then the appropriate place to talk about that is in a committee so that they could hear both sides of it. It should not be adopted here in the Finance Committee, uh, um, uh, uh, nor the argument that okay, put it on and, and you can take it into conference committee. That's not the work that should be done here, Madam Chair, and I would ask the others to oppose it, and I would ask for a roll call vote. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my concerns are similar to what uh, Senator Champion just um, very effectively outlined. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that I know is that um, – my problem with term limits as a just a black and white situation is, you know, you lose, you can lose some really important institutional knowledge there. If people are effectively working, I mean, that can be an asset. But my bigger point is, I've never served on this council. Um, I'm really, why did, why, um, Senator Ingebrigtsen, why didn't you bring this to committee? Senator Ingebrigtsen. M Madam, Madam Chair and, and Senator, thank you for that question. I. I have no no reason that I did not bring it there. Uh, it's just one of them things that all of a sudden we get caught up in time and and uh, um, 
I, I just I just happen to think, and I think if if folks were to, to uh, go through this and, and Senator um, understand that, that an appointment actually can only go for four years if they wanted to. If they want to step down, uh, then the same appointing authority will appoint somebody. It just simply says you, you can be there, but you can't be there any longer than eight years. And frankly, members, I, I, uh, I think legislators should be the same on this committee. I, I think they should pass that around as well. Uh, I think maybe uh, uh, somebody else might take some interest in it and, and want to be on it. Uh, I didn't go that far with this particular thing, um, but uh, because we eventually do have the say, these are these these members do the, a tremendous amount of work and make recommendations to the legislature. It still can change uh, in bill form once it, once the recommendations are there. Um, but uh, you know, uh, it's it's my fault, strictly my fault, that I didn't bring this forward. And and. Uh, um, it, it sounds to me like it needs a little bit more work. It sounds to me like folks need to talk about it a little bit more. I wanted to throw it out there for a discussion. And with that, Madam Chair, I will, um, I will withdraw the A3 amendment. Senator Inkpritson withdraws the A3 amendment. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Before we even got a chance to go to you guys. <laughs> Are there any further comments? Questions? Okay, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Madam Chair, I uh, move that Senate File 2969 as amended. Has it been amended? As amended, be recommended to pass and placed on general orders. On that motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion prevails. The bill does pass. And now, Senator Root and Senator... Um, Senator Lang, please stay there. Yep. Senator Rood, uh, House File 3438, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. House File uh, 3438 is the um, annual legacy uh, bill, the outdoor heritage portion. As you know, we pass a major legacy. Grab, grab the microphone. Just, yeah, there you go. Thank As you, you know, we pass a major legacy bill every other year. Um, last year, we passed a bill um, $700 million out of the legacy. But the uh, Lazard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council is, pa is uh, a yearly appropriation. And so this uh, House File 3438 is the bill that matches up with the House um, that's uh, already been passed. And so this bill is basically the same. It does include uh, extensions for projects that during COVID were not able to um, finish their projects because of COVID and it's only appropriate that they be allowed to have that money um, and finish their projects. So this uh, bill also includes those um, extensions. Senator Rood, um, is, is that, where are, are they just peppered throughout the bill, ones that had problems with COVID? <laughs> or is there a certain section for that? Uh, I believe they are, um, and I would have to ask council uh, about that. Where they're exactly located. Um, I believe some of them are on page 26, they're carry forwards. Oh, okay, very good. Yep. Okay. Do we need Daniel? Okay. Um, before. Before we uh, bring Mr. Mueller up, Ms. Uh, Director Johnson, do you have anything that you'd like to say on this? No? No. Okay. Mr. Mueller, if you could please come up. Could you explain the difference between what we just passed with Senator Langs and this House File 3438, please, and and the appropriations in there? Um, Madam, <clears throat> excuse me, Madam Chair and members, um, Senate File 2969, as amended, is the updated version of the uh, recommendations from the Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council. Um, currently, House File 3438, as it came over from the House contains appropriations um, if we're looking at the house 
bill contains appropriations from additional uh, the some of the additional legacy funds the the clean water fund the parks and trails fund and the arts and cultural heritage fund the house um, spent additional money from the other funds um, up to the a five percent fund balance the senate file um, senator rude senate file 3701 and now currently uh, senator lang's uh, 2969 just spends money out of the outdoor heritage fund and up to a six percent balance um, currently the statutes require a five percent fund balance in all four of the legacy funds originally when we appropriate out of those funds in the odd year we leave a five percent fund balance in each of the funds to um, make sure that we have enough money due to the fluctuating uh, sales tax. Um, so, like I said, the, the house file as it stands right now contains the same bill as 3701 for Article 1, but then it has additional spending from the other legacy funds in it. When was that 5% um, setback put into law? That was. Madam Five, Chair and members, ago? is uh, happened back. Um, Senator, Senator Cohen was was very strong about keeping a right. fund balance, and Senator Rood also has been very strong about uh, keeping the the five percent fund fund balance to make. And it, it rang true back um, two years ago when we had the the deficit at the beginning of COVID, where the sales tax projections did really drop and we have actually did pull had to pull the five percent fund balance actually wasn't enough for a short amount of time um, but then once future forecasts came out the we were able to restore all the the appropriations that we had to pull back on but it, it seems like the five percent fund balance has, has worked well to protect against the fluctuations that happened with the sales tax and the five percent fund balance is appropriate percent um, Senator Rood? Um, Madam Chair and members, um, when we when the Senate took over the um, the legacy fund in uh, 2016, um, we really looked at what structural changes that we needed to make, and so in the 2018 <coughs> bill, we realized that we needed to put a five percent balance, a hold back, and not spend all the money all the time. And so um, this body um, decided to um, put the hold back in a 2018's bill. Um, and it's worked very well. Um, during the pandemic, all of our funds were solid um, and they didn't have any problem functioning. We didn't lose any money. And so we think the 5% holdback has been a really good uh, addition to the bill structurally. 5% okay. is the appropriate amount? We think, don't think so. It should be. It's, yeah. it's really, it's, um, it gives us enough money, enough cushion in case something happens like it did with the pandemic. And it seemed to really work well. None of the, none of the funds went under at that time. There was appropriate amount of money to um, help them out. Okay, very good. Do we have any questions for Senator Rood? And Madam Chair, if Senator I may, um, <clears throat> there are some additional spendings in the House file that the Senate has not done. And the reason we did not do that is the Senate has been very um, adamant about the integrity of the funds and how we spend the funds. And uh, I sit on the Clean Water Council and none of the appropriations um, included in the House file were recommendations from the Clean Water Council. They did not recommend any spending this year. And I know that we have um, several members, I know, um, that have been very um, adamant that the recommendations come from the councils that are part of the legacy. And uh, the Clean Water Council did not make any recommendations. So we did not include any of that spending. There was an additional $47 million that is available to spend, but we do not know what the economy will be like next year. And the integrity of the fund is that we don't spend that money except for in the even years. And so um, we would like to keep the integrity of the spending and the process in place. Many groups are looking at the um, the next funding cycle, and it will, I think it would be inappropriate to spend that money now and jump that process when those folks are working on their um, projects for the next funding cycle. And it would only be um, appropriate for them to be in that cycle the way they ha have always done. So that is why we did not include any of that spending uh, in our Senate bill. So the 47 is above and beyond the 5% setback? 
Oh yes, it's just yeah. it's what just is spending, um, and many of the groups have not asked for the spending because their budgets have already been done, mm -hmm. and so to simply give them a eight percent funding increase uh, when they have not asked for it, it's not part of their budget. Could they spend the money? Of course they could. Sure. You know that you can always find something to spend the money on, but it's not part of their budgets. It's not part of their um, project processing, and so um, we just think it's not appropriate this time to spend that money. Okay. Okay. Mr. Mueller, what is 5%? Um, Madam Chair and members, currently in the uh, Ultra Heritage Fund, a 5% fund balance is about $6.9 million, leaving on the bottom line. And similarly for the, the Clean Water Fund would also be a $6.9 um, okay. million dollar, um, fund balance. Yeah, there. that's a great idea. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay. Okay. I think we'll go to uh, closing comments. Who would like to start? Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate uh, not only the the good conversation, but uh, the support from the council and. Uh, I think we touched on a couple of topics that have been uh, more towards the forefront of what the, at least from my uh, vantage point with we'll start Sam's council is probably going to have to start talking about um, thing, things like term limits and things like how do we protect our lands uh, after we've purchased them, uh, how much property should the state of Minnesota own in comparison to uh, private landowners. Uh, those are all topics of conversation we're definitely going to have to put on the agenda and, and start chatting about. But uh, with that, I appreciate all the support. Thank you, Senator Lang. Senator Rood. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, and I, too, appreciate the, the support. And as I look around, um, I, I think we forget um, that not all of you sit on the Environment Committee and that not all of you are so familiar with all of these funds and how they work. And they're very intricate. Uh, when you talk about the legacy in LCCMR and we start using acronyms. Um, and so I really appreciate having this conversation today. And, and um, <laughs> it's, we, we forget that not everyone knows about all of these uh, funds. And so um, I, I, I know Senator Ingebrigtsen is very familiar and as is Dallas, but um, as we go forward, I really appreciate the, your attention to detail today uh, and moving these, uh, this very important not everyone agrees with the legacy and the LCCMR, but they were voted on and they are in our constitution. So it is our, it is our job to spend the money the way the constitution and the voters told us to. And I think we've accomplished that in, uh, in these bills. And I think the Senate can very, be very proud of how we've used these dollars. Um, last year, for the first time ever, the legacy passed off the Senate floor unanimously. And it's through all the work. I know um, Senator Champy and I have had many conversations about how to make it work for everyone. And I think we've really uh, worked hard and the Senate can be proud of accomplishing it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rudin. And no joke, every year I have to have a, another um, a tutorial on how these funds work. <laughs> it is amazing, and I do want to thank both of you uh, for your for your work in this area. Um, Senator Rood, thank you very much. You've been a, a true champion in this too. So, Senator Lang, um, and of course, this will be your last year, Senator Rood. That's very sad, but you have a great legacy here. So, appreciate your work on this. Any further comments, questions, Senator Ingebrigtsen? Madam Chair, I move to amend House File. 3438 as follows. Delete everything after the enacting clause and insert the contents of Senate File 2969 as amended. On that motion, there's going to be two motions today, members. On that motion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay? Motion prevails. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Madam Chair, I move that the House File 3438 be recommended to pass and be placed on general orders. On that motion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Thank you very much. Senator Lang, Senator Mr. 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 Mueller, <laughs> Director Johnson, thank you very much. So, members, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, they, <laughs> the motion prevails and the bill does pass. <laughs> Got a little sloppy there, didn't I? Um, tomorrow, members, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 
six bills up. So um, uh, stay tuned, and I'm sure we have more bills next week too. I'm not sure what days we'll be meeting next week, but tomorrow we'll start at 8.30. Any questions? Okay, with that, thank you very much. Meeting is adjourned.